Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the UFO Whistleblower Marathon. This is a three-part series. Each one of these three men have testified under oath in front of Congress. Our first guest is Michael Herrera, who witnessed a human trafficking operation in Indonesia where UFOs were involved. If you like what you see, please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Leave us a review on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And for those of you that are content creators, we've seen you taking our episodes and making your own content out of it, and we love it. In fact, we made it super easy on you. Go in the description. There's a file down there. It has lots of free produced reels for you to make whatever content you want out of it, monetize it, make money, do whatever you do. All we ask is just tag the show. Love you all. Please enjoy the show. There's two more coming. Michael Herrera. Sean. Welcome to the show, man. Hey, thank you for having me here, brother. It's an honor. It's no, an honor. no, the honor is mine, dude. I like, seriously, there are so many people that are pivotal in this environment, I should say, that you've placed in this chair that have made other people uncomfortable with what they've talked about. Um, a lot of people who understand not all is what it appears. So hopefully I get to add to that and share with the rest of the world, at least in the sense of what you're doing, because like I told you, I'm not talking to media about this. Well, I appreciate it, brother. Well, you're all about the truth these days, just as much as I am. And, and it's ridiculous how much is being concealed for a narrative. And frankly, I'm disgusted with it. I am too. You know, we try to do a number of things here. And the things that I really, I try to do is document history from our military heroes, because yep. nobody else is doing it. Bring truth, uncover corruption, and bring hope. We bring a lot of hope, you know, a lot of guys that are struggling, and women, you know yep. what I mean, that are struggling and uh, overcoming all that trauma. That's that's what we try to do here. But, and with you, we're bringing truth. Yes, we are. So. And out of that, I want to bring hope too, you know. It's not just with what I'm dealing with amongst the other people here that, you know, have amazing stories too. As much as it sounds outlandish, and don't get me wrong, I think, you know, I can agree to that, at least with the outside perspective. Because my before my event, I was actually very skeptical on it. I'm like, oh, that doesn't exist. ETs don't exist, aliens don't exist. It's only out of movies and stuff. And it scared the shit out of me when I was a kid, you know, some of those movies. But then this event um, changed my life in that degree because it confirmed a lot that day. It, conf oh, yeah, it confirmed uh, multiple facets, not just with, you know, the technology aspect of it, but just the level of corruption and how deep this thing goes, you know. And needless to say, it's something that it was a catalyst for other things to at least kind of change my life to start not looking into it with directly, but just kind of try to go deeper. What actually makes things happen. Yeah. You know, so. Well, let me give you a quick introduction here real yeah, quick. Yeah, go for it. So. Michael Herrera, you were in Indonesia in 2009. You had a UAP slash UFO encounter. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you were a U.S. Marine, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines. Yes. And you were at Operation Kitsana, correct? Yes, and Kitsana was in the Philippines, and that's we didn't participate in anything that. We actually got routed to go to Indonesia in that take. We're the only ship. Okay. So a lot of people are getting confused with that. Um, the rest of the seven fleets stayed there, and we were the only element to actually go to Indonesia, far western side of Sumatra. We'll get into all that. Yep. Before we do, everybody that comes on the show gets a gift. Uh oh. Yep. Yep. Any any guesses? Uh, as long as it's not an explosive device, I think we'll be fine. You better listen. Make sure it's not ticket. Oh. What's well, not ticket? Let's see what we got here. It's our. Uh, Ooh. Vigilance Elite Gummy Bears. Gummy Bears. I got some stickers, man. Nobody else has these stickers, by the way, too. Nobody else does. But, uh, wow. but I don't know. Fortunately or unfortunately for you, I'm not sure which. Those are legal in all 50 states, so you don't have to worry about getting up through the airport security <laughs> or anything. But you live in Colorado, so. Hey, they got a little bit relaxed <laughs> loss of that. Sean, thank you for the gift, brother. You're welcome, Appreciate man. Appreciate it. But um, so we connected through Dr. Greer. Correct. At his conference in D.C., he brought in a handful of whistleblowers. You were one of them. Yes. Greer came on the show. He wanted a military audience, and uh, I believe to get 
whistleblowers after the new law got passed where there yes. was protection for people to come out. And it's funny you say that because um, 2017, Dr. Greer actually came to Colorado. Um, he was hosting an event in Boulder, kind of doing some disclosure, kind of talking about some of the technology with the ATs, you know, um, UAPs, and just reverse engineer stuff, just kind of go like the, the whole grand scheme of things. It was like a several hour presentation. And I had my ex there at the time, and uh, I kind of hinted to her that I needed to talk about some things with him. So he was doing a book signing. So I go over to his table, I snag a book, and I'm like, hey, can you sign this? And I was like, by the way, there's some things I need to talk to you about. And he kind of looked at me weird, and I said, it's very serious. So he handed me his card, and he says, don't ever relay this information out to anybody. And me knowing with what I knew at the time, you know, which obviously there was some stuff that were in the works until they recently passed here last year, uh, two days either before or after Christmas when they put this law, which I think is the only good thing the administration's done so far, to be realistically speaking. I don't care if that makes people uncomfortable to know, but it's helped me out among other people. It might be the only good thing he's ever done. Um, fast forward to your show. You had him on the first time. And my fiance and me were watching it, and that's when he started relaying the information and started talking about the law that was being passed. And that's when I decided to reach out to him. And he knew exactly who I was, which was great. It was like having talking to a friend for a while, and I was going to call him out of the blue, and it's just like everything just resumes back to normal. So um, I expressed to him, told him my story, my encounter with this and, and what happened. So then we arranged everything to go, at least to go talk with the Senate Intelligence Committee, Congress, Senate, uh, Pentagon, all that fun stuff. And uh, it was a journey. It was definitely something that opened my eyes to a lot more because here I'm thinking my event was something that was more specific. But come to find out, I'm just a cog in the wheel with this whole big thing because there's other facets that I'm also confirming these guys' stories to, to a degree. Mm -hmm. The corruption, um, secret organizations that have some pull in this and obviously some of the nasty stuff that they're doing. And um, there's other people down the road who are going to corroborate what I'm talking about too. I don't know who they are. Maybe some of the Marines that I, uh, I w encountered this with too. Um, so I'm hoping that that's what's at least if the message gets put out there from the show, I'm hoping that that's what it does is they can get people to actually do something about it and not be afraid of it like I was. It was 14 years, you know. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of weight to carry, try to sweep it under, but the more you try to do that, whatever you resist persists. That's always a golden rule. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. That's a damn good point. So just a quick um, synopsis here. You responded to a 7.6 magnitude earthquake and a tsunami hit in Western Indonesia. Uh, only your crew was routed to that location to provide support. Indonesia has a large terrorist population Marine crew was armed and tasked to provide security along with medical equipment and food supplies. But correct. it was just your unit. Yes. Uh, which there was five of you, correct? Yes, there was. And so um, they ended up choosing the Marines out of my unit, at least in the company, to go out. So it's not like every single Marine in the, the company was able to do this. They just handpicked people to go on these sticks of six Marines. So originally it was supposed to be more of like a deterrence, but also uh, overwatch protection. So that way these helos can drop the supplies. The logistics groups that were a part of it can then render aid or whatever it is to the local population there. Was it volunteer or were you hand selected? Hand selected. Or? Okay. Or voluntold, I should say. Okay. <laughs> voluntold. <laughs> Good way to put it. Yep. And uh, I'm just curious, you know, what, what are you hoping to accomplish by coming out? I want other people who have witnessed similar things or are part of certain things that are very controversial but end up being true to come out and understand that what's going on is not acceptable. And it this is just a facet of corruption. It may not be the political corruption that's coming out now that people are witnessing with their own eyes. People call them conspiracy theories. What I'm hoping to achieve is to get other people on board to understand that the government supports what we're doing because they were in the dark about this too. And now they're coming out and they're actually putting the hammer down. Uh, recent bills have been passing as far as the legislation through the Senate Intelligence Committee saying that these corporations have to give the goods here in six months or else there's going to be some um, consequences they're going to face either through the judicial system, which obviously the government's got a lot of weight with that. The other aspect of it, too, is that they're going to ban these companies from doing contracting work for the government, which means they're going to lose billions of dollars. They're going to go broke. So I'm hoping that they actually comply with this measure because, one, this technology is going to help benefit humanity as a whole, not in a militaristic sense because that's just foolish. 
it's more to help out humanity because now everybody's going to be on the same level technology wise. I think the common ground here and the, the narrative with that is you're hearing people come out, at least in the mainstream media, is trying to talk about ETs being able. My event had nothing to do with ETs. And there's some misconstrued concepts that are going about. The technology may have came from ETs at, at one point, and that's what we witnessed. But we witnessed much more of a sinister plot with this that they're using it. Um, for people who don't know, 2009 during this operation, that's why we're responding, obviously with the humanitarian nature of this, because 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit, that's mainly what the expertise is, at least as far as Marines go. It's not really combat operations for the most part, even though Indonesia, among other parts in that world, are large networks for terrorists and insurgents. Mm -hmm. So um, having that expertise of going in and try to help people, I think is also good to us because it teaches you the balance of it. Instead of being a war fighter, you actually get to help people. Instead of you know, launching bullets at people, you're still helping people in a different cause. You still get to be heroes for people, which is great. So uh, totally incidental um, as far as our encounter, when we went onto the slope because we had our LZ, it was a hasty LZ, and they're dropping supplies. They have, you know, a bunch of stuff. And it's other helos, too. They're just kind of forming a perimeter on the city, dropping Marines here. You could provide overwatch. Now, the only thing that's unsettling with this is the fact that they never gave us any comms. You know as well as I do how risky that is. You didn't have any comms? We didn't have any comms. So the Marine that was with, was with me, that was a higher rank than me, was very pissed off about it. Because he was a Fallujah Marine, you know, so he went through a lot of shit. Yeah. And uh, one of those things, he, I remember him kept telling me, he's like, if, I, if everything ends up going to shit um, and you look at me and if I'm fine, it means that you're going to be fine. And I remember him tell, telling us all that in the stick, you know, and he was a, he's a good Marine. He's a very outstanding guy. I uh, learned a lot from him during my time in. And uh, I thought about that concept, but then he started picking things apart, too. He wasn't very comfortable with that. But the, luckily, the thing was is that we were still relatively, you know, close enough to the LZ because when the bird was supposed to land, because obviously they were coming in, dropping the supplies, and they'd bank off. The last one that would come down would land. That's when we'd basically run to the helo 300 meters. You're in good shape, and you have an average combat load, you know, 120 rounds, so to speak, with an M16A4 and a Camelback. Not really much, you know, so you can make that trek relatively quick. But they also have security on those birds, too. With the flight crew, with the gunners on the sides, they had 50s on them. So if there is some opposition, they're going to meet with those on top of us engaging them. So we were positioned near the slope. You know, it wasn't like a steep grade or anything, but it was enough to obscure what was going on on the other side that we had no idea what was going on. So we got, you know, naturally you want to take the high ground so you have observation of everything. And this is when we came across this operation. And it was something that stuck out like a sore thumb because here you have um, terrain that is a jungle terrain very green vegetation, things like that. And then you have something that's sticking out right in the middle of an opening, and it looks very odd. It's something that's, you know, I'll remember to the rest of my life, to the day that I leave this earth, I'm going to remember seeing that, and it's just imprisoned up here. I had a camera with me. It was a Panasonic cheap camera. You know, it had kind of like, um, you know, ancient compared to what you got set up in the studio, you know. But it was enough at least because it was part of stuff that I would, I've never did a humanitarian assistance before. Mm -hmm. So I was taking videos of them dropping stuff off, things like that, until we trekked up to this point. I was taking some pictures because it's a place you would never really ever go to, at least a real part of Indonesia. It's not like Bali or Surabaya where it's like uh, touristy stuff. Yeah. You know, this is where it's actual culture people. You're actually seeing reality here. So it's stuff that I kind of wanted to document and just say, you know, I was a part of this. I can look back and say, you know, oh, I, I remember that. But then turning to looking north past that slope and seeing that down, and I took some video and some pictures of that. And um, I had, you know, I stuck it in my dump pouch. You know, I was a saw gunner naturally, you know, so I had an M249. That was my favorite weapon. I liked having a belt-fed machine gun. As much as a pain in the ass, um, I liked having that compared to an M16 or an M4. So because we were in a humanitarian, all they did was give us uh, M16A4s. You know, they had um, RCOs at that time. They weren't the ACOGs. They had the mills on the sides for windage and stuff yeah. like that, um, as well as the PEC-15s. You know, so if we were doing any kind of uh, night range or night operation, we'd have those with our PVS-14s. So it's just a very basic loadout that we were, we were doing, you know, um, nothing really crazy. And when we saw this happen, saw this and I want to say unidentified because right now it's identified. Everybody knows what they are now. They're either man-made or they're not. 
And if they're not, the government's coming out and telling people, admitting it, not directly, but they're still admitting it to a degree that it, it exists. Because why would they spend time with this legislation coming out? That's that's a good point. Why would they do that? If, it's, if it doesn't exist, why were they going through these measures to basically hold a gun up to these guys' heads and say, you better relinquish this technology or else? They're not just doing it. And uh, knowing and seeing this unfold, even being in this position of having to brief the Senate Intelligence among uh, the Special Intelligence Service, too, which oversees the letter agencies, because they have no idea what's going on either. But the fact that all of us coming together and making this loud amount of noise to get something done about it is just astounding. And now they're finally, for the first time in history, they're going through with this and actually trying to do something about it for their own understanding, but also know the corruption that comes from this. Yeah, it's multiple different facets. I mean, you get you guys already, all five of you, right? Already testified in front of Congress. So we testified to people of the Senate Intelligence Committee, which were there's some Congress people there as okay. well as some senators. So in front of the Intelligence Committee, by yeah, the yeah, and, and you know, yeah, and you know as well as I do, in any kind of setting like that, whether you're in a skiff, it's all under oath still because that's they're signing, having you sign NDAs and things like that. So you're expected to be truthful with this, mm-hmm. and. Um, Seeing it's the a reaction, big deal. it is a very big deal. It was nerve wracking at first because I'm not used to talking to government officials in that nature. And um, having the support that they've been giving me as well as the protection is just something that I'm very thankful for. I'm very thankful that they all have open minds of this subject. I want to tell you all about this new meat delivery service I found called Moink. What I really, really like about Moink is they are from a small Rural farm town in Missouri, LaBelle, Missouri, right by where I grew up. And I love supporting small town business USA. Now, when I started looking into Moink, they educated me on the meat industry. And I want to share with you all a couple of facts, according to Moink magazine. 60% of all pork is produced by one company in the U.S., and that is 100% owned by the Chinese. Four companies control over 80% of the meat industry in the United States. More than 10,000 different additives are allowed in the U.S. food supply. 99% of chicken, 95% of hogs, 78% of cattle in the U.S. are raised in confinement buildings or feedlots. Means they're not moving around freely. 80% of the antibiotics consumed in the U.S. are fed to animals. Here's a stat. In 2016, 18.4 million pounds of antibiotics were sold for livestock. And that's what you're eating. Suicide rates amongst farmers are the highest than any other profession. And that includes veterans, believe it or not. I found that alarming. Now, here's what Moink is doing to combat some of this stuff, which I really appreciate. Their livestock is 100% born and raised and harvested humanely in the United States of America. Their farms practice regenerative agricultural methods. They are free of GMOs, antibiotics, and all hormones. Their Alaska salmon is wild caught. Their beef and lamb are grass fed and grass finished. Their boxes ship from rural America, right in small town Missouri. Love it. Their chicken and pork are pasture raised. So, guys, check them out. Moink. Keep America farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash SRS. Right now, listeners on this show get free bacon in your first box. It will be the best bacon you will ever taste, but it's only for a limited time. It's spelled moink. M-O-I-N-K box.com slash S-R-S. That's moinkbox.com slash S-R-S. Even though there, you know, for years there's been a stigma to it. For years there's been a giggle effect because of little green men and flying saucers and all that. I myself never thought to this day that I'd ever seen anything like this. So going back to the event, we decided to get in the tactical column and approach this, right? And we got down the slope and it's just like a clearing and just has this big opening. It's almost a little bit more than the football field because this craft took up majority of that. So let, let's just back up for a yeah. minute. Let's, let's describe the setting because at first you said there were helos going, doing racetracks yes. around 
Is this the same opening that you described earlier that you were watching Helos drop supplies No, 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 no. Okay. So um, where this was happening was southwest, at least, where the Helo insertion points were with the LZs that they were setting up. And they were flying very low in consideration, in consideration right? So, and the, the reason why I know this is because I asked the pilots after this because I was on the officer's mess and I knew their call signs and I approached them and asked them very respectfully if they noticed anything strange. None of them said anything. Okay. So I was trying to see if they could get a view of a topside because this is just something that's crazy, right? Yeah. So um, also their call signs all stuck out too, you know, because pilots like to do crazy stuff with their call signs. So it was very easy to track them down. But having this happen on the north part of the slope and it goes down and obviously, you know, the way it was transitioning colors, which was kind of the way that it appealed because it was transitioning for a light matte black or no sorry a light matte gray to a dark matte black and just kind of ranging in between right well, let's 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 rewind a little bit before we get into the description okay how far so what was the activity with all the other helicopters were they active at the time that you saw the honestly I do, I, when we started going down there no um, okay. And I don't know because obviously we we're occupied with this. How far do you think it was? So from us, from the LZ where we were at was 300 meters roughly. Okay. Plus the slope that was concealing plus vegetation. Down the slope, it was like three, 400 meters, maybe. So we got close. We trucked down quite a bit. Okay. About 150 meters outside. 150, 200, right? Halfway. And so maybe about a click away. Possibly. Yeah. At the, the, the craft itself might have been a click up. Okay. Yeah. And as like I said, um, the reason why I know how big this thing was because did you see it as you crested the yes the hill? Yes, I did, and that so that's where I took videos and pictures of this thing. That's how I was able to see it because you know taking pictures of the chaos going behind and everything. You see in the rubble, burning buildings, flooding, and all that kind of stuff. And then you turn around, and I'm like, so you 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 crest this hill. Yep. You look down into into the valley. Yep. And there's a clearing. There's a clearing with a UAP. Yes, just sitting there, sitting there, hovering. rotating clockwise. Yep, and that's in transition. This color spectrum I was telling you too, and that's why it's kind of it's something that stuck out. It's not a building, you know. It's not something that you're used to seeing. Maybe topside, it could have looked like a building or something that you know. I don't know. I'm not. I don't have that perspective. I wasn't a pilot or anything, but I can tell you from our point of view, it's something that just it looked very unnatural and abnormal. And that's what got our curiosity to go investigate this. Now, normally, because we had, we would have had comms, you're damn right, we'd have called it in. Report something suspicious. Maybe get some eyes on a helo, get a hold of their call signs, and try to do them um, fly around, and they never did. And obviously, we didn't have comms to do it, but they were more occupied with what was going on behind us. So when we trucked down and got around 150 to 200 meters from it, you know, and this is an opening. By the way, um, there's no tactical advantage being in this situation because you don't have cover, it's jungle. You have concealment, but this kind of concealment with vegetation is not bulletproof. Mm -hmm. So when we trekked up close and we were attack calm, so obviously you have points here, right, at each Marine, so you have visuals of the sides, somebody has a point and somebody has a rear. And all of a sudden we were involved by this military force of, I still to this day don't know who they are. And How close did you get? To the craft? To the craft. Roughly 200 meters, 150, 200. Did you get to the bottom of the hill? Yes. So you could see, so you saw the top of it, and then you could see underneath of it. And underneath Maybe. of it had this platform that was on the ground that was separate from this craft hovering. And it was it was very weird to see, and I was like, okay, I don't know if that's kind of like a cement pad or something. I don't know if it was like a helo pad or anything like that at first. But then started seeing how the material would kind of look very similar to what the craft was. It was like, well, that's separate. So you have something that's on the ground, stationary, and then you have something that's up top, and it's just rotating in a clockwise position. So right when we got close to it, um, at least you know, 150, 200 meters out, then all of a sudden we were engaged, at least not in a hostile manner, at least, you know, not gunfire or firefight or anything like that. But the way that these guys moved was so fluid, it was so still, it was very, very, very smooth. And it kind of indicated to me, um, after thinking about it for several years, is that these guys have done it for a, a while because of how smooth this operation was. Mm -hmm. So when we were in a tactical column going towards the center of this thing, they actually came from the flanks, but it was more of a diagonal, like a corner of the room, so to speak, right? For them in a tactical advantage, they have interlocking fields of fire on every single person, and they had a team of eight, right? 
And the gear that they had was black OTV vests. They had black camouflage utilities. They so had, what, what you're saying is there was there would have been no Mexican. They were professionals. Yes, there would have been yes. no Mexican standoff where no. if they fired, they're shooting into their other squad. They had they, they had perfect angles. Yes, they did. To where both sides could engage you. Yes. Team of four, team to. of four. So it was like a fire team element. Without worrying about a blue on blue no. situation. Exactly. Okay. So, um, you know, with that being said, because as they, as they approached us, you know, hear the f safeties flip off. Now, your attention to detail, when you're seeing this kind of stuff, your sensors are very heightened, so you can pick up. I know you being a combat veteran, you know, you know all about that. Your heightened sense of awareness is going through uh, astronomical changes. To Hypervigilant. A, yes. So you can hear stuff a lot clearer. And that's where you kind of picked up the hum that this object was doing along with these guys flipping their safeties off, especially M4s. You know, it's very distinct sound. Anybody in this room who's held M4s and has shot them, M16s, things like that, it's very distinct sound to flipping it off. So um, we kind of knew, and they started yelling at us. You know, they were like, you know, you're not supposed to fucking be here. What the fuck are you guys doing here? Who the fuck are you with? You know, so they knew. They were using the kind of lingo that we, we were used to, especially in the military. So it made me think that at some point these guys actually were uniform military at one point. Any accents? Uh, not accents. It's just like American dialects, how you and I are talking. Uh, very, you know, they, at one point they said they were going to smoke us. They could throw us out of a helicopter. They could. It's very easy to get lost in the jungle out here. You know, they kept saying stuff like that. So after they enveloped us, they all pretty much got online. They told us to put our weapons, so we all got online as well. And we had our hands up. We had our weapons slung. And... Um, they're having two guys watch while there's a guy basically taking our magazines out of our vest. And they're throwing them on a deck and they're kicking them away so we don't have time to react. They also, at the same time, the first thing they did was obviously take our weapon and clear it. But they took the magazine out and they actually held it in a way to where they could pull a charging handle and collect the round and have it not hit the deck. So they, the, the way that these guys operate was very smooth. It's very calculated, very precise. You could tell they've done this a lot or they rehearsed it a lot. You know, especially combat operations, you're doing terrain model rehearsals, you're doing rehearsals whether you're clearing rooms, trying to figure all that kind of stuff out. These guys kind of did the same thing, I'm assuming, because of how smooth it was. And because you know as well as I do, you get, you know, you have new guys that join a unit and they're not that fresh. You know, they're very choppy because they have the basic understanding. Mm -hmm. You either had to stack up and do room clearing. Um, and the guys that have done it and been through combat deployments and all that, they're very kind of methodical, very smooth because they know what to expect. These new guys, it's not the same thing. You could tell these guys were seasoned. So as they did that, they actually, um, each Marine had two guys on them, plus one that was taking the stuff off of them. They actually knew where our military IDs were because in Marine Corps order, you have to have them in your left breast pocket. So there were 15 of these guys, three on each Marine. No, no. So they had other guys right here, and they had three that were just going through each Marine. Okay. While other people were holding each Marine at gunpoint. And they're not like... Um, they're not like super close to us range wise with, uh, you know, because if you get a muzzle close, I mean, it's easy to grab mm -hmm. it and, you know, kind of fend off, especially with a rifle. But these guys were off at a standoff distance that even if you try to move, they could, they could, they could smoke you. One search team of three guys. Yes. And then the rest of the squad was aimed in. Yes. On Hold. Okay. Yeah. So, and again, you know, they're not anywhere where they could actually, there was people behind us because obviously if they had to engage, they're going to hit one of their own guys probably. So it was more like they were kind of the, moving the same way through all of us, all six of us, okay. taking our stuff, taking uh, pictures of our military IDs, you know. So they had like these devices that kind of look like a very thin, it looked like a smartphone modern day right now because in 2009 it wasn't the case. I think the most high tech thing they had at that time were maybe Blackberries, but they're bulky at that point with the yeah. ball. And then they had their flip foam razors and things like that. But these look like something you'd see today. And they were taking pictures of their military IDs and they had something, some other device that was like a, uh, remind me of a bat system. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Describe it. It's like a biometrics tracking system. So what it does is when you come across with an insurgent, you can take pictures of their face, okay. their retinas, I know what you're fingerprints. Talking about. Yeah. Something like that, but they were trying to have a they were trying to scan our IDs with this thing and it wasn't working. So they're kinda of getting frustrated with it. So as this is going on Did they collect biometrics from you? No. Okay. No. Which I'm, I mean they took pictures of us, but that might be enough and then they took our IDs, you know, because some people I talked to that are in the special operations community with that, they said, Yeah, we have the ability to scan IDs and it tells us everything about you. Military IDs, driver license, things like that. So it's very high speed stuff. I mean, and considering this was in 2009 compared to now, 
I mean, of course, they had this thing that they were using to load up stuff. It's very advanced physics, you know, something hovering off the ground, not making any sound, but an audible hum, like a, a guitar amp or something that's like a, a transformer. So it wasn't like, it didn't sound like a jet. No. It didn't sound like a helicopter. Hell no. There was no engine noise. Nope. Just a hum. Just an audible hum. Very, it's very creepy to see because it's not normal. Was it like a bassy hum? Yeah, yep, okay. like a guitar. Like if you were to unplug it, I mean, it wasn't the same pitch, but it was like the same, same kind of sound, same kind yeah. of noise that it emitted. And um, so as they're searching us, we're watching this thing happen. And that's when we started seeing trucks come from our left and go onto this platform. And they were up armored 350s. I know exactly what 350s are. They were kind of beefier trucks, they were matte black. When they were coming at us and they go left, and I was glancing between what was going on in front of us with these guys, and then all of a sudden glancing over to what was going on behind them. And that's when I started seeing the key details of this thing. Like it had like a scale pattern on it, kind of like an octagonal, because it was craft itself was like an octagonal shape where you could see points. It had a pyramid structure on top that was black, and you can see the shadowing of it as it rotated. But it was rotating very slow. And then every, it had like these vents on every single corner on the middle part of these platforms, on this, uh, the panels anyway, there was like a Vanta black. It was like a dark black that would like absorb light. Very weird. Very. What, what do you mean by that? A dark black that would absorb light. So if you ever familiar with the BMW, they painted Vanta black. It was like a very super dark black. It's not like a reflective material at the all. The matte black? Yeah, but very, okay. very, very, even darker than matte black. Okay. Like you can shine a light at it and it won't even illuminate. Like the Batmobile. Kind of. Okay. Something like that. But even, it was like very dark. The only way I can describe it was like the Vanta black. Okay. And um, so, so as you, when you mean absorb light, you're saying if I shine a laser on it, you probably you might not even see the laser, correct. or it would be very dull. Correct. Okay. Something like that. So we're watching these vehicles, right? These trucks. Now the thing I would say on the front of them, because you know hum, um, Humvees, the military has, they have the IR lights on the front near the headlights that you can drive at nighttime with your knots. So they had the same thing because they had the same kind of slits that had the IR lights. But they had uh, weapon cases in the back of each truck bed. And, you know, you could store like a couple hundred weapons, maybe a hundred weapons, maybe a platoon, a company size element. And um, it was the same Pelican cases that we would use to store stuff when they were transloading, you know. So very big cases on two of them in each truck bed. And then they had a shipping container thing. I mean, it looked like a shipping container, but smaller and half the size. And the thing that was different about this is I had a cylinder on the front of it that was towards the truck. It was like parallel to the ground, just a cylinder right on the top of this thing. And uh, for years I thought, okay, you know, like it's gotta be oxygen supply or like a vacuum sealing thing that you would, you know, cause obviously I'm thinking it's drugs. I was like, okay, so this is a very advanced way to do that. Just years of thinking of this. And um, come to find out when I gave my speech in DC on that Saturday for the disclosure project with Dr. Greer. Um, he's got a lot of people coming out of the work, woodwork, by the way. And this gentleman, I'm not going to give any detail. I know a little bit about him, but he works in some of these projects at a very, um, some very controversial facilities. He's aware of what was going on. After I gave my presentation of this, he confirmed, he says, no, he's like, I don't want to leave Michael hanging out there, but I was not expecting to come and talk to you about this. And he went explaining what the operations do, why they do it, and what they were using them for. And he says, there's not drugs that they're putting in these shipping containers. He says it's humans. Human traffic. Yes. His own words. And, he, you know, of course. And he also wants to come forward, at least uh, with him and 30 other people that are involved with that part of the work. Um, but it was very disheartening to actually get that information relayed to me. Because here I'm thinking for years it's drugs and it's a much sinister thing. But it makes sense because they use natural disasters that people are going to be missing anyway. Yeah. It, that's, Scoop up people. I mean, I just, uh, I've been covering human trafficking this year. Right. And that's, you know, a lot of the human trafficking comes from third world countries in distress. You're in a third world area. Yep. In distress right after, a hearth, right after an earthquake would be... I mean, it's prime, yeah, prime time to to do a human trafficking operation. Right. How big were the containers? Uh, I would say probably eight feet and ten feet, eight feet tall, ten feet within. So, like maybe half a Connex box. Yeah, about that. Okay. And they were kind of like on a, the trailer that was underneath was kind of like a regular Humbry trailer that you would see, kind of pull stuff. 
something like that. How were they being lifted into the craft? So they were driving onto this platform that was angled and sort of hit, and it just raised up, and they were just driving on this ramp. Oh, the but truck the whole would go thing, up? Yeah, but the whole thing was a ramp, okay, like a circular ramp. And, I mean, obviously I can't see what's on the, excuse me, the other side of it, but I'm assuming because it's a circular pattern that it's going to be the same on the other side. Because they would drive onto this platform, and at that point I saw all the doors open, four guys would come out, and then I'd go back to what we're facing here with these guys searching our stuff, asking us questions, taking our IDs, trying to intimidate the crap out of us. And um, so I can see the guys come out of the truck. And that was making me think, too, like, at a tactical advantage, we didn't have that. There's only six of us, basically trained infantry Marines. And there's these guys here that are, you know, doing this operation and very skilled, very methodical, very calculated, very precise. And if there's eight of them, and then all of a sudden every single truck has four of these guys, I know that it's not just these guys that are running the perimeter. They could have been 40 or, you know, 30 or 40 people. Yeah. Could have been a platoon size element. And the fact that we have no concealment, I mean, we barely have any concealment, because if we were to run and bank off the sides here to go to our flanks, they could just engage us. There's nothing to hide behind. Yeah. Vegetation ain't going to stop bullets, you know. But so there's a lot of uh, questions I have, too, because it's, you know, obviously if we would have engaged them, then the whole rest of the force behind us would know about it because they'd have heard the commotion. Yeah. How many containers do you estimate were put into the craft? Four, because I saw four trucks. Four containers. Yeah. And there could have been more, but at that point where we saw, we could have, you know, because— we stumbled onto this thing. We ruined their, their operation, so to speak, because we weren't allowed to see that. Let's talk about the craft. Okay. How big was it? 300 feet is what I'm estimating, about a football field. And the reason why I say this is because we flew on a CH-53 Super Stallions. I'm sure you're familiar with those. Mm -hmm. Your time was a SEAL. They're roughly 100 feet, all right? So from nose to tail, if you lined up three of them, it'd fit three of them under this craft. Because I can see, you know, especially the operation behind us, you kind of see them off in the distance, so you try to gauge, you know, as a Marine, you're always trying to judge distance, you know what I mean? Because if you're having to engage, but lo and behold, we end up having a surprise right here happen with these guys. But that's how I know it was around 300 feet. Okay. That's a, that's a, and it was circular. Circular. It's like an octagon because it had like corners on it that was like an octagon shape, but still circular. Could you see, was it one smooth piece of metal? No. Was it panels? Panels. Yep. How Which, are they, how... Just describe more. Were there windows? So, were there There openings? were not windows, nothing I could see like that. Um, it just had that Vanta black vent looking things on each corner, is all I saw with that. And it had like an octagonal scale pattern that went through it. It honestly reminded me kind of like a design for an F 22 Raptor. Okay. You know, I like the top of it, it kind of looks like that. Yeah. That's what it kind of reminded me of with because it would transition those colors. So I suspect, you know, I've had people I've talked to about this to say, well, you know, Lockheed Martin has reverse engineer stuff that's circular. Raytheon, they have triangular craft. And he said it might have been Lockheed because Lockheed also made the F-22. Interesting. Similar design concept. Now that I think about it, right, because at this time you're not really thinking about it, you're like, I got the, I'm got more concerned with these guys and who the hell they are. So after we witnessed the last truck going on there, and we're still dealing with that. I got searched already, of course, and I'm just paying attention to what's going on. I'm making sure my guys are good, too. And all of a sudden, the trucks, we never saw them again. They, they were not on that platform. There was, like, boxes and stuff that were on that platform. And uh, so I'm assuming they either drove off on the other side or disappeared. Where, or where they went, I don't know. But all of a sudden, we noticed that this platform raises off the ground by itself. It doesn't make any noise, by the way. It doesn't disturb anything. It Bef just, before it started gaining elevation. Yeah. How high off the ground was this? The right. actual craft? Yes. I would say probably 20 feet. Okay. Yeah, good distance. And the platform rose up, but I would say like the platform was up uh, several feet, right? Probably maybe five, six feet, because it was, you know, from the distance, probably about a half an inch. I mean, I'm just envisioning, I'm envisioning a, the way you're describing this, I'm envisioning an, an octagon yep. rotating mm -hmm. clockwise with a drop ramp similar to maybe something you would see on the back of a C-130, C-17, but circular. But circular and separate. There's no cables, there's no... Okay. Yeah. Was the ramp attached to the craft? No. 
So there was just an opening? There was just an opening. Like the bottom part of the craft, I was what I'm assuming because that's where I saw it lift up and go into. It was okay. like the bottom part. It was like the, the floor itself was like the platform and they were just rolled up, right? But at the same time, the, the top part leveled a little bit and went down to meet with this. And as that happened, you start to see it rise up past the tree line. And it's not like a super fast and just rapid. It's just like kind of slow. As that's going on, the rotation has not changed. The audible hum has not changed. But It's not like somebody hit the gas and you hear a different Yeah, it's nothing like that. Noise. It's no, just, just constant. Okay. Each point on that octagonal shape started to illuminate colors. Like, and it was just one color per point. It was red, it was green, it was yellow, and it was blue. It was the only colors I saw, and it was rotating, right? As soon as it got to the top of the tree line, like cleared the trees, this thing shot off to the left. And to the left was the ocean, by the way. This was going west. How far to the left was the ocean? Um, probably a good mile and a half, maybe. That's it? Yeah, it was so you're right on the coastline. Yeah. Okay. Probably, I would say me. It could be a mile and a half to three miles, I'd estimate, because I'm, I mean, that's just estimation. I don't really know. Because it took us a little bit when we landed into the uh, near Padang City, because we landed at the airstrip and then we took like a several minute flight going from southwest to like northeast part, roughly. So I'd say probably a couple miles esti to, to kind of estimate. And like I said, it didn't change pitches of noise or anything, and it just completely shot off. I mean, it's just like a blur that went left. Didn't make a sonic boom. Like you'd see a fighter jet when you see the pressure that, you know, the way that that happens. It didn't disturb any of the trees like what Rotor Wash would do on a helo or a, a jet flying the map of the earth and leaving an exhaust and blowing the, you know, you kind of mm -hmm. see Top Gun movies with a crank no propulsion. Up on Nothing. There were even coconuts that you could visibly see on these trees. None of them were disturbed. No shit. Yeah. And me, I like, I like aircraft, you know, that was my thing. You know, I wanted to be a pilot, but that didn't happen. I wanted to fly the Harrier. And um, I know about aircraft. I know everything that we've got. I know everything about them, you know, from a little kid, that's all I wanted to do, you know, but obviously then being infantry was the next best thing. So um, it wasn't something I've never seen before, something I know that we didn't have, at least in the conventional wise, on top of the military force that was there. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a minute since I've done a Bub's Naturals commercial, but it has not been a minute since I've taken the best shit of my entire life. Actually, just knocked one out this morning. It was amazing. And I'm gonna give you the secret. You ready? Here's the secret. You want the secret for the best shit of your entire life that you could do, I don't know, every day, maybe multiple times a day. Here's the secret. Bub's Naturals Collagen Peptide says it's good for joints, hair, skin, and nails. I'm surprised they don't put on there. It'll give you the best shit of your entire life, but hey, I get it, right? And you mix that with the Halo Creamer that's MCT oil. Put these two together, you're gonna have a explosive <laughs> hell of a day. These things are both Whole30 approved NS. F certified and USDA approved. So there's that on top of that. Hold on, wait, there's more. If that doesn't get you going, which I guarantee you it will, you've got Bub's new coffee. So this is the first ever coffee bean Whole30 approved, if you can believe that. And we all know coffee can, you know, speed things up a little bit in the morning. But hold on, wait. There's more apple cider vinegar gummies. Guys, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know exactly what these things do for you, but uh, here it says, promotes energy, immune support, promotes healthy digestion, and supports healthy metabolism. I can tell you one thing, good luck just eating one of these things <laughs> because at the end of the night, I will crush an entire bottle of these that will not give you the best shit of your life. I wouldn't recommend it. It will speed things up, but you may not like the final outcome. And hold on, wait, there's more. There's more. Bubs came out with a lot of new products. They have these hydrate or die hydration packets. 
great for post-workout. All this stuff is great for post-workout, especially the uh, collagen protein. Guys, here's another thing about Bubs. Bubs is a tribute company. It's named after Glenn Bubs Doherty, who was a Navy SEAL and a CIA contractor. He died defending our freedom in Benghazi, and Bubs donates a portion of every order to the Glenn Doherty Foundation, and they donate 100% of the proceeds from their products on Veterans Day every year. I love this company. They are just solid people with a solid product, and they just want everybody to experience the best shit of your life. Go to bubsnaturals.com, use the promo code SEAN for 20% off, and let's get it going. We're all hooked up, ready to go. John Master's got his arm up, getting ready to hit me in the back. And then we see shuffling, and I'm only one of 12 guys that I jump with every time. He filed a classified, uh, a classified complaint under oath, and the intelligence community inspector general said that he found the complaint urgent and credible. A guy from the back shuffles his way to the front, and is one of the escorts. He is unmistakable. I get a knock at the door. It's that same guy who cut me out of the door, hands me a note, said thinking of you, he's like, hey, sorry about your loss, buddy. I think it gives weight to a lot of the people that have come forward and talked about having direct first-hand experience. To me, it just felt like somebody looking you dead in the eye and said, I can touch you anytime I want. Well, when was the assassination attempt? So we go inside. Meet another escort in there. Uh, take us to this freight elevator. One of the guys looks at my dad and is saying to both of us, yeah, keep your head down, your eyes on the heels of the man in front of you, or you'll be shot. What could somebody threaten you with to make you turn your back on your own child? So, as that took off, we're all of a sudden ordered to face that slope that we came down. And then, like I said, it's not very high up. I mean, it's high enough to obscure everything to kind of go down in the valley. And um, so as we turn around, I'm like, fuck. They're going to do it. I think they were just going to, you know, fucking rip us right there. Yeah. And You're worried they're going to kill you. Yeah. Does that mean it's like... When you... when Before we get to that... Yeah. When you saw this thing take off, I mean, do you have any estimation of speed? Have you seen anything? I mean, was it faster than anything you've seen before? Yeah. Was it a, oh, was yeah. it a normal speed? How no, it was it was faster. It was the fastest thing I've ever seen. It was I would say probably four five thousand miles an hour. I mean, it was instantaneous. It was just like it left a blur. Okay. You know, like a jet screaming by going as fast as it possibly could. You can still make the shape of it and still lock your eyes onto it as it's going. There's no way in hell you could lock your eyes onto this thing as it's moving. That's how fast it was. Okay. And eyesight, you know, you, something moving, your eyes are naturally going to pick up that motion. And this didn't do that. I mean, it was just like, it just left a very fast blur. And um, like I said, I've never seen anything like that. The way that it moved, the way that it didn't make any sound, completely, you know, didn't change pitch of the hum or anything like that. Did it go at an upward angle? Was it a straight line? It just looked like a straight line from what I couldn't see. You know okay. what I mean? It just, it wasn't like it went up in the sky or anything. It was just like, went over the trees and was gone. Okay. So yeah, I mean, you know, knowing aircraft and things like that, it just wasn't something normal. Something completely faster, something doesn't make any sound. I mean, radar sensor, I have no idea, you know, but there's theories that maybe the design of it could not reflect radar signals. I mean, I don't know how that go. I'm not, you know, I don't work in that project or anything like that, but it's just something that's very odd to see. Very, very alarming. Did the lights stay on as it, yes. as it took off? Yep. The, but I you guess. couldn't even see the blurs of lights even. It was just this black blur that just left. Damn. Yeah. I mean, it was creepy. It was, it was fucking creepy to see. Yeah. And, you know, of course we're like dumbfounded because you've never seen anything like this. And this is like some Hollywood shit, you know? make the ships from Independence, they look like a joke, you know, yeah. <laughs> how fast this thing was. So, um, 
it was it was very 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 weird to see that and like i said as we were ordered to turn towards the slope that we came down and that's when i thought it was it i thought they were going to smoke us you know and they kept saying that you know we're just we can kill you right now you know they're as as this is going on they're talking shit they're looking at us they're taking pictures they're doing you know everything that they're trying to do clear us so as we turn this and all of a sudden i see a sling pass over my head I'm like, oh, fuck, they're going to strangle me. But that wasn't the case. They actually tightened it so well that when they placed it and, you know, it's crossbody, and obviously the buttstock of the rifle is up on the right shoulder and the muzzle's kind of more towards your left. And they tighten the sling so well that if you try to get it off, it's going to struggle, right? And they started putting the magazines in, and they put all six of them on our vest, but they put it in a way that wasn't tactile. They put them, like, right side up where you can see the brass, right? Because mm -hmm. brass to the grass is usually what we always train our Marines to do. So you just take it out, pop it in, boom, right? And um, they did in the case it would be tactical. It wouldn't be a tactical advantage to do that. So by the time you get your weapon off, try to put a magazine in and charge it, you're already going to get smoked. Yeah. So were you, these, you were standing up when they did this? Yes. Yep. And when I saw that sling come over, I mean, I was like, fuck, I thought they were going to strangle me. Were they talking to you as they were doing this? Yes. Uh, that's when they were saying they're going to, you know, smoke us. They're going to kill us. They could shoot us, you know, leave us here to die, stuff like that. Why do you think they were doing it? I mean, it sounds like they were taunting on they, they were. And I think, you know, my personal opinion is I think they wanted, I think they really wanted to kill us. But if they made any, I mean, because they didn't have suppressors, you know, they had M4, A4s. They had like the high speed set out. They had actual ACOGs. They had the honeycombs on them. They had the uh, um, PEC 16s, which is a step up from what we had. They had steel magazines. They, their weapons are like they were brand new. Do they have nods? No. They no had ball caps, though. Ball caps? Yep. They had no insignias, nothing that would signify what their rank was, um, nothing that would signify what branch if they were. There's nothing identified. And, you know, law enforcement agencies are typically try to be uniform with all black so you can't really identify who they are specifically mm -hmm. and it's like how these guys were doing the same thing because i know in aos at least where you have friendlies you want to identify who's what because that's how you're going to coordinate between everybody if you know who's friendly who's not so if you're having to do anything like airstrikes close air support casivax you know what to say and what they look like paint the picture for what you're getting into to provide other people that intel and these guys were just uniform black ball caps and it's just you know, it's very obvious that these guys didn't want to be identified, but they had American dialects, they had American lingo, similar to what Marines would use, or at least military. So that's why my suspicion is, I think that these guys at one point were uniform military, and maybe they got swept in this program, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Could so, you see their faces? I did. They, they, uh, three they of the guys had facial hair, right? Kind of stubble. Some of them kind of, low, not really long beards, but like an operator look, you know what I mean? Yeah. rest of the guys didn't. Uh, some of them had kind of blonde hair, at least that you can see from right here. Some of them had like black hair and then um, just regular white complexion. Some okay. of them had blue eyes, some of them had brown eyes. And I think one guy that I saw had, um, he was the one that was mainly focused in on us as we were getting searched. And you can see he had kind of like grayish blue eyes. So I don't, you know, I don't know what military force. I mean, obviously it's not conventional. Yeah. Because, you know, the question, if they ever come out and they decide to, if they decide to ever do this and say, yeah, I was there, it was these guys, I would have a question. So the question would be, why did you let us go? Or what were you guys thinking? Or why were you guys doing this for the matter? Because this isn't something that, you know, me consciously, there's a lot of things, especially finding out that this happens to do with human trafficking. Morally, I could never do that. Yeah. That's a touchy subject for me. They might not know. Yeah. And that's just it, too. I mean, they could have. I mean, maybe the guys in the trucks were more of the darker side of things that were doing the hands-on, and these guys were securities. I mean, there's so many theories with this. You know, I've, ha I've seen some flack on, on Reddit about this. And you got all these armchair quarterbacks like, oh, I wouldn't have surrendered my weapon. Oh, yeah? So you get pulled over by a cop. And he's got his, got his gun drawn in. Because, you know, there's some people that that's their interaction with police because they're known to be violent people. The cop is not going to take any chances. They're going to pull out their sidearm and they're going to approach the vehicle like this, tell you to get the fuck out, right? Are you going to chance anything this guy is shooting you if he's holding you at gunpoint? No. No, you got kids. You got, you got a wife. You know, you got a bunch of stuff to live for. I know these Marines have the same thing. 
but it's always these people who are going to talk this shit who are not there. Because I know for a fact that I'm here, I'm here today talking to you about this. I was here, you know, talking to the Pentagon and talking to all these other people about this to testify to them and tell them what happened. And I'm glad that, you know, I'd rather get the flack than have to sit there and actually whatever story they would have sp spun up to say that, you know, maybe one Marine got PTSD or something, decided to kill his own squad and then kill himself. Mm-hmm. I mean, whatever they would have spun it to be. If these guys have this kind of technology and these resources, they can do anything. Yeah. They're above the law, clearly. So as they gave us our stuff back and we're going up this slope, they're still talking shit. They're still saying, you know, we could kill you. Don't fucking look back or we're going to smoke you. So as soon as we went over the top and all of a sudden we didn't, you know, they weren't pursuing us and we fucking hightailed it. We ran down this fucking slope try not to trip over shit, go to the LZ, and there, there were still helicopters flying. You know, they were flying relatively low with this, the uh, shipments that they had that were attached, and then they were landing, dropping the stuff off, and then they were taking off, right? And they were just coming and going back and forth. There was a gunnery sergeant there that was not in my unit. I think he was attached to the ship. It might have been kind of like their, their logistical support unit or whatever it is for, because I know each ship has a logistical support for Marines, right? that are on the ship, either active security, whatever it is. There was a gunnery sergeant there, and he was, like, fucking pissed because we showed back up and we weren't supposed to. And then we had our weapons, you know, so why were we conditioned for? You know, and we tried to play dumb, so obviously we kind of, like, set up a perimeter and then we adjusted ourselves. Some of my guys, you know, they'd help us get our stuff unslung and then we'd load it back up and, you know, act like everything was normal. But I can tell everybody's faces were like, what the fuck? Very, very concerning stuff. And here's the thing, though. If stuff is still going on to this day, which I'm sure it is, because if they're, you know, come to find out, and I know you probably know this, human trafficking is the biggest revenue generator for these guys, mm -hmm. for these organizations. Second's drugs, third is weapons. So if they're hitting all three, and obviously they're not going to want to give up their operations being known for that because it's illegal. It's not going to sit very well in the public eye. A lot of people have children. I don't have, I personally don't have kids, but I know you as a dad would not fucking stand for that kind of shit. Yeah. Because then you have the thought in your head that it's going to be my kids are going to end up like this. That potentially could. And it's not a very comfortable thing people realize. And having them known to see this happen, it sucks. And this is kind of more why I'm pressing towards getting the, the resolution done with this. Um, to make the government aware of it. Because if that's going on, it's got to be stopped. That's some evil. That's some evil nature right there. And I can't believe that there are actually people participating in this. And if they know about it, fucking shame on them. Yeah, you know it's 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 very interesting. There are two subjects that um I really wanted to dive into this year. Is I'm fascinated with the UFO UAP um, genre. Right. And I want to expose as much as possible. Um, the stuff about human trafficking and right. everything that goes into it. We've already started that. And to see these two arenas start to intertwine is, I mean, it's very alarming. It tells you how much money is being spent. And it tells you that there's companies here that the government doesn't know about that are participating in this. Yeah. And it's not even, you know, something that happens in the United States. It may, you know, it, it definitely does. But to see the operation, because think about it, it's a, it's perfect cover. Because let's say if you're hiking somewhere out here and you see that unfold and you try to call the police, you try to call, you know, federal, state, local agencies, or even the military for that matter, try to report this, are they going to take you serious? No. <laughs> they wouldn't. I mean, and, it's, it's, it's becoming more and more common yes. as time goes on. But yeah, it's, you know, what's... You know what sucks about this is we're in this we're in this time period where everybody knows not I guess not everybody but it seems everybody that I know knows that the media is false. Yeah. It's fake. They they don't report everything. They lie. No they you, don't. You know and, and 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 but at the same time a lot of people won't put any validation or trust in anything that hasn't been covered by right. mainstream media. So we're in like this time period where there's 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 a transition happening. There is, and it's thanks to people like you. And I'm glad that there's people with me doing this too that, you know, 
It's easy for for people to sit there and try to judge what they would have done in those situations. And the bottom line is, is we have gotten a point in our life, and I don't mean us specifically, but I mean the rest of the world, where they get so disturbed with things, but they don't do anything about it. They want other people to do it. Oh, I'm ha- unhappy with the situation. Well, fucking change it or help change it. Yeah. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the word out there. We're trying to get the government, at least the right parts of the government, to do something about this. And, you know, among other things that you see with corruption, you know, um, for example, you talk about the media. Like I was a security, at least for my private security firm for the America's Frontline Doctors in Washington, D.C. And they came to talk to President Trump about um, COVID not being as serious as what the media is trying to say it is. They said that vaccinations are not something required to beat this. They were talking about natural immunity. They were talking about all the things that we already knew. Well, people are getting silenced for it. And I'm seeing these doctors, especially uh, Dr. Simone Gold, you know, so they try to wrap her up because she was part of the January 6th thing. But she's actually a really nice lady. But she's explained to us how everything worked because they took us out to dinner, you know, to, to try to thank us. And it was very cool to network with these people. And then all of a sudden you go after the event and you start seeing the news articles pop up about these people. And it's completely defamation. It's completely stuff that's not even related, you know, and and... It's one of those things that it's, it's, it sucks to see because their lives were ultimately ruined for speaking out about the truth. But here's the thing. There comes great risk to stuff. Comes, you know, my life doesn't get lavish because of what I'm doing today and what I've been doing. It yeah. becomes hell. I've had um, numerous encounters with fucking helicopters hovering over my house. They were hovering over my dad's house. They get so low where they rattle the walls. Scare the shit out of the animals that we've got. You know, his dogs were going fucking crazy at that point. And he was concerned because he was, he was home. And he was like, I've never heard anything like that. So, you know, having, I, I've taken videos of this too, but seeing Blackhawks, seeing regular black helicopters that don't even have insignias on them, nothing. And they're just sitting there. But the thing about it that is at least noticeable about this, and it's just kind of a, there's a hysterical factor to this how much money they're fucking spending on this to happen to try to either intimidate me or anybody else for that matter. There's some elected officials and even some government officials I know they're having the same thing happen to them because they've told me about it personally through our encrypted source of what we talk about. So they instructed me that anytime that something like this happens that I could record it, take pictures because they'll see the timestamps of everything taken and let them know the time and they'll investigate it because they can have access to the FAA systems and among other systems that I can actually relay where these people are going. They can listen into their comms, you know, because I have to guide through the FAA air traffic, you know, where they're going. I live by the airport in Denver and the airspace there is restricted because they have airplanes that are flying, you know, every directions to try to, you know, passenger airliners or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it's not a normal flight path for helicopters. That's what stuck out to me. Um, They were doing it at my place of business where they'd fly over, they'd stop and then, you know, they would bank off. My dad's house, they get low, you know, enough. Um, it's just, you know, it doesn't become glamorous by speaking about this. And We're you have people maybe that you've met through uh, when you testified in front mm-hmm. of uh, the intelligence committee that, yep. that are helping you, yep. they're telling you, hey, record this shit, time yes. stamp it, let us know any information you can possibly get. Yes, because they said they'll look into it because they know, I mean, and several of them are having to deal with this personally. Is this happening to... Any of the other whistleblowers that you know? I know it happens to Dr. Greer all the time. Okay. Um, I, other whistleblowers, I'm not sure. Okay. It's not something that, you know, maybe they do notice, you know, because you're hypervigilant with what's going on. Because, I mean, with what we're doing, it's putting us in the spotlight, but it's also putting the fucking crosshairs on onto us. And the only thing I'm thankful is coming public with this information, at least if something does happen. And I'm not going to rule that out. But if anything does happen, and it kind of proves what we're talking about to be true. And the reason being is because they would not be going through these measures to try to intimidate for no reason. Yeah. We're keeping people up at night because of what we're talking about, and that needs to happen. Yeah. So, you know, and I've I even told these government officials when I had my meetings, I'm like, first and foremost, you guys need to understand something. I am in a right state of mind to do this. I don't feel like harming myself. I don't feel like, you know, because everybody makes the joke that Epstein didn't kill himself. No way in shape or form related to that, right? And um, so uh, same goes here. Like I don't, f- I have no means to harm myself. So if anything happens, it's not from me. Well, thanks for, thanks for saying that. Well, um, yeah, I mean, that needs to be on record and people yeah. need to understand that because if something does, it's not because 
I, you know, I turn a gun on myself or anything like this. Specifically, I'm going to talk about something. Um, El Toro, El Toro um, Marine Corps Air Station El Toro. I'm sure you're familiar with that. It was out in California. Um, there was a uh, colonel there that was didn't even know that this was going on on his base. They, but they were flying flights in that had drugs on them. And they were unloading it on his base, and he found out about it, so he went to question them. Two days later, they find him dead. Really? Yep. Is and this on record anywhere? Yes, it is. You can Google this information. Put Marine Corps, uh, Marine Corps Colonel uh, Suicide, El Toro. Okay. okay. You can pull this out. Any of these viewers can do that, too. Um, the family thought it was very alarming because the circumstances. So they did a second uh, opinion for an autopsy. And they said that there was extreme blunt force trauma to this head, which killed him. But then they had a gunshot wound, so there's a shotgun that were supposed to stage to look like a suicide. And um, so I'm glad that the family actually got the second opinion to say, no, it was blunt force trauma to the back of the head is what killed him, and they tried to make it look like a suicide. And this is a colonel, and the thing that sucks about this is the Marine Corps itself actually tried to use this as a tool to say, you know what, suicide awareness is such a big thing and it happens with every rank and they were using this guy for this purpose. But then all of a sudden you start delving into this information and seeing that, you know, the reports that he was making about these illegal flights coming in and they were unloading drugs. I mean, it, it clearly, these guys, it doesn't matter what rank you are, it doesn't matter what position in government you have, it doesn't matter what you do for a living. If you're going against what they're uh, exposing what they're doing, they're going to get you. So if something does happen, I'm just putting it out there that it's not from my own doing. I don't fucking piss anybody at maybe, you know, maybe in the business world to a degree, but it's not enough for them to sit there and, and do something like that. And I'm glad that I have a, a private security firm where I've got some guys who look out for my best interests and they know what I'm doing. So they've got my back, realistically speaking. And, you know, and that's the thing, too, is any other whistleblowers who, you know, because I urge other people to come out. If they're needing protection out of the way, I'll help with that. I'll orchestrate, I'll orchestrate, but two, the other thing is two, coming out in the fashion that we did was the best because now the right people in the government know. So it's almost like having a pit bull that's one to rip you to fucking shreds, but you have this fence that's between you and this pit bull. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the government's going to be that fence and along with the, the spotlight that this put me in. Yeah. Because it's unsettling to sit there and see these helicopters, man. It's just, it's, it's hysterical. You sit there and wave them, but it's like... Keep wasting your fucking money. Let's talk about the debrief that happened afterwards. Yes. What happened when you got back to your command? So um, when we got back onto the ship, we ended up returning our weapons to the armory, um, went to our berthing, put our gear away, went back to the flight deck. There was this admiral there. I've never seen him before. I don't know who he is. But it was just very out of place. He gave a debrief saying, hey, this was good that you guys are doing for these people, which I agree with. But I have no idea who he was. But, it, you know, I've been on six ships, did several humanitarian operations, and not once have I ever seen an admiral on any of them. You know, and this was minor compared to the one in 2011 we did with uh, Fukushima and that natural disaster. Never seen an admiral with that, right? So um, it's just very out of place. So we went to, after we concluded this operation, we ended up docking in Subic Bay for some liberty. It was at least like four days. So... The people that we encountered during that event didn't even bother to take my camera or anything. It was in my dump pouch, but it was small enough, so I don't know why they wouldn't have searched it, but they missed it, right? So here I am the whole time thinking, like, fucking A, I've got something. I'm not fucking crazy, and neither of us are crazy. Like, we've got something that actually backs up if we were to tell anybody about this, and we can show them pictures of it off of a camera and not something like a computer screen where they can doctor it. Well, uh, I spoke too soon because when we end up going out that, that first day, we came back to report back to the ship, and I saw my camera on my rack. And the memory card was out of it, and it was a big memory card. And the battery was out of it. And I just see the camera sitting. I'm like, what the fuck? So I checked my locker. It was secure because that's where I had it. And I had some stuff on top of the camera in there, you know, in my locker that were on top of the camera. And I had another battery in there, so I took that battery and I put it in there, and it wouldn't even turn the fuck on. And I had some people reach out to me that said, you know, if you had that camera still to this day, that they could do some data retrieval and maybe be able to pick it up. I'm like, but I don't have that camera. Um, you know, it would, I tossed it because the fact that it wouldn't even turn on, it wouldn't do anything. I'm like, fuck, it's just a paperweight. And then, and of course, 2009, you're not thinking of anything with uh, forensics, you know, where they could do something. There was people actually willing to do that, which is great. So somewhere out there, somebody's got this footage. Somebody's got that, that tape because there's some reason why they took it. And fun fact is that the other five Marines that were with me, they had their phones taken. Did you look at the pictures before 
Did you did you have a chance? I know to look I took pictures? pictures and videos of it because I saw the record thing and I actually can snap the photos and you can see like a blink. That's mm -hmm. the way to describe it. So I knew for a fact. But you didn't go back and review them. Okay. No. No. Nope. Why not? Uh, one I didn't see it. One anybody see. Okay. Just for that reason, you know, it was just something to keep. You know, if anybody doesn't know about it, then if I start telling people, then obviously there's things that may happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, it did happen regardless. Because as soon as we're out in town, all these people, you know, I don't know who it was who did this, by the way, but they didn't even cut my lock. They popped it off somehow because they re, you know, my lock was still intact. So these guys are obviously know how to do it, and I don't know who it was, but all of a sudden the other Marines had their stuff taken too. And anybody in the platoon, they didn't have any of their stuff touched. It was only us that were there. Did they take anything else? No. Nope. So after we get done with that, we end up going back to uh, Okinawa, right? And I'm, you know, this was a regular normal day. It's probably fast forward a month after we end up getting back. All of a sudden, a duty Marine knocks on my door and says, you need to report up to the CP. I'm like, roger that. So I get my cover, run downstairs, run over, and there's nobody there. I'm like, well, what? this is fucking weird. And all of a sudden, like, I go inside, and there's, like, this big opening in his office, and then they have, like, these little offices that have these little doors that you can walk into. So all of a sudden, I'm greeted by somebody in uh, uh, Air Force dress blues, and he didn't have a cover on, but he had salt and pepper hair, white complexion, older gentleman. He didn't have a name tag on his uh, uniform, which, come to find out, um, Air Force regulation states that you have to have a name tag on your uniforms. You know, Marine Corps, we don't do that unless it's our camouflage or if you're a drill instructor or some kind of instructor or some sort of billet that requires you to do that. So um, he calls me over, and I go over, give him the proper greeting of the day, and then he tells me, go ahead and sit down over here in this office. So I sit down, and he just he doesn't even bother to sit down. He just, just says, you though wasn't the other five Marines. No, they him? end up having the same thing happen, but this guy did it separately. It's all individual. Yes. Okay. It wasn't all together. So um, he told us again, with what you guys saw, you're not allowed to report this. You're not allowed to talk about it to your family, not to your chain of command. I don't care if a general even asks you. You can go to prison for this. You could be executed. And if you want to chance that, by all means, but you need to sign this. So I take the paper and I look at it and it's a non-disclosure agreement. The only two things I can recall to this day is that it said uh, TSSCI and it said Indonesia. Hmm. Those are the only things I could recall. But I skimmed through it and I fucking signed it because here I am thinking, okay, we're just gonna forget about this whole fucking ordeal. And yet this is getting thrown in our face and here's somebody threatening our fucking lives here with you know imprisonment, death, things like that if we're to talk about this. Did you ask him any questions? I, I tried to ask him who he was and he didn't say anything. There's some speculation going on about this because people who know about this, um, whether it's other whistleblowers and other people have came forward previously, have said that um, these guys have the ability to impersonate or even play off as their um, military officials or anybody for that matter in the government to try to extract information to see what you know. So I'm not, you know, because it's, it's odd that he didn't have a name tag. He had, uh, the only thing I could tell is that he had a stack of ribbons. You know, Air Force gives ribbons and medals for just about anything, but he had silver jump wings is the only thing I can recall. So other people I've talked to in the military community are still active, um, just trying to get information. And now they know because I've came out, they were saying that, it had, that if it was an Air Force officer, that has to do with someone, Air Force intelligence, because a lot of them had jump wings and that's kind of the thing that they like to do. He says, because he didn't have any pilot wings or nothing, that would signify he was a pilot. It was just those silver jump wings. Yeah. Just with the parachute and they had the wreath that come up like this. That's the only thing. And obviously he had the silver oak leaves on his, on his uh, shoulders. But um, so after doing, dealing with that, it's like, okay, signed it. I'm like, great. You know, just fucking leave it behind. The rest of my career, don't tell anybody about it. You know, didn't tell my family. I told my dad before I ended up going and getting out of active duty and going to reserves. Um, I said, you know, there's some something I got to tell you. And he even told me this, you know, when I started coming out publicly about it and after I had gotten through the right part of the government to go ahead and proceed with this. And now he understands what I was trying to tell him because I said, I just have to wait for the right time to do this because I, I don't know. I'm kind of freaked out, you know, something. And um, at that point, 2017, that's when I met Dr. Greer. And then fast forward to recently in April, um, making this happen with the government and telling them and testifying and um, briefing them what's going on. You know, so the flack that I'm seeing with this is, you know, there was a guy, apparently it was a Marine that came out with Dr. Greer. It was like more than 10 years ago. I think his name was Joshua or something like that. 
and he was a stinger operator, so he was like an anti-air gunner, if you want to call it that. I don't know the MOS. But apparently, he was in South America, and he witnessed a crash retrieval. And um, so he stated the same thing. This paramilitary organization kind of looked very similar. Obviously, this was in the 90s, so they didn't look that dissimilar to what I saw. But he talked to paramilitary organization. He talked about the noise that this craft made that he saw that was shot down, had a hole in it. So it was a guitar amp, because that's the only way to describe it. If it's reverse engineered, it's going to mimic the same kind of technology that these actual crafts have, mm -hmm. right? This paramilitarization, well, yes, that's how they operate. They're not going to be identified in any kind of way. It's going to be a generic black uniforms and gear. So, of course, and, you know, everybody's like, oh, at least the Reddit that I'm seeing. And I said, oh, the Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. Okay, that's another thing. And it probably wasn't the same guy, but the same method. There's only one word that comes to that. It's called corroboration. Yeah. And it's not the first time that this guy's saying it. It's not the first time that other people have said this. But the thing is, people only pay attention to them when stuff's thrown in their face, such as what I'm doing and what these other people are doing. There's going to be people who are going to come out after me who are going to talk about um, the same thing. I know I'm not the only one. And maybe I can get one of my Marines, you know, that were there um, to actually come forward. And maybe, you know, ideally it'd be all of them, but I know how this goes. And one guy responded when I had uh, these government officials and Dr. Greer trying to bring one of them forward. And he said, absolutely not. He sent a text message saying, it's not worth the, not worth the risk to my family, my life, my career, because he's still in the military. He's a commissioned officer now. And uh, he was very repetitive about that. And he says, don't ever ask me to do this shit again. And you need to get the fuck out of whatever you're in. But it's the response that when I asked him to do this, and that's what he responded to, what else could it be? Yeah. So in a sense, that kind of corroborates it. But it corroborates the seriousness of how they're in fear of their life. Yeah. The other guy, I didn't hear from anything. And even taking my social media down because after I started coming forward, I just don't want people blowing up my fucking inboxes, trying to ask me details or questions or try to get interviews. You know, I'm not about that. I'm not, you know, the fact that our lives are kind of coming to hell to a degree because of being pursued with these helicopters and things like that. There's other ramifications that may happen that I'm not aware of, but you know what? There's a risk to things and that's how this is going to happen. And if that's what's chosen, then I just got to figure out how to mitigate that as well. Well, let's talk about, we, we had spoken offline a little earlier about all the media that's reached out. I know yeah. you had an article in the Daily Mail. Daily Mail, and then obviously the other facets are related to Daily Mail publish this. Well, they misconstrued a lot of that. And then they end up going in from David Grush to bash and Dr. Greer about it. So it was something that they trying to use like to get people's attention, and they go into this fucking narrative. You know, I've had uh, News Nation, I've had CNN, I've had MSNBC that reached out. Um, through LinkedIn, through other emails, you know, because there's my email gets blasted all over the place these days. And I've got four emails, so I'm, I got the fucking shitty one I hand out to people because I don't want to get spammed through my business emails because that's money that's sitting on a table if need be. And um, I decline every single one of them because I know that they're going to push this false narrative. The false narratives that there's are evil ETs, and this is what David Grush is pushing now, saying that, you know, they're malevolent and they've seen people, ETs die or he's heard ETs kill people and things like that. Well, first and foremost, if there is a species of extraterrestrial that's out there and they happen to be fucking malevolent, it's not wise to shoot their shit down or kill any of them because guess what? These They're highly advanced. Yeah. If they can make this kind of stuff, imagine what they can do if they weaponize it. You know, so it's, it's something that, you know, this needs to stop because all it's doing is this pepper, uh, it's just portraying fear out to people. Yeah, they did this with COVID. You see the response of that. People are still living this way, living like COVID exists to this day, which it probably does, but it's not nearly as uh, damaging as, as what people are saying. Yeah, it wasn't as bad as uh, was hyped up. To no, be. it wasn't, and you still have people fucking afraid of their lives. And this is the thing that is sad to see that. So this whole now that people are thinking about this going on now that all of a sudden worst case is going to happen. It's just this whole fear being. Uh, portrayed in the media to try to scare the shit out of people, either get ratings or try to get people tuned in their networks is just ridiculous. Yeah. It's more, you know, it's more of a personal game for them because they get money off of views. So now that you've set the record straight, do you think you'll go on any of these media outlets? No. No? I'm not looking to get it. fucking famous from this dude. Yeah. I just want to get this information out. This ain't gonna get, you know, I've had try, people try to approach me with book deals and shit like that. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. This is nothing to do with trying to get money. This is trying to make sure that and this is, I'm not trying to convince the public here. 
And I'm getting that on record, too. This isn't trying to convince the fucking public that this is real. I'm trying to convince the government, and thankfully they are convinced enough to actually do something about it. That's my main objective with this. Good because of, when they come out and they start talking about the bills that they're talking about, legislations, because of people like me standing up, among other whistleblowers coming out and talking about the same kind of corroboration, that there's man-made stuff going on, that there's nefarious activities going on behind the scenes that nobody knows about, and they're making money illegally, and they're murdering or killing people doing it. I'm glad you're doing it. I'm, I'm glad too, man. It and it, it scares the shit out of me. I wake up every day unsure, like, what the fuck's going to happen? But that's why you had to take it day by day. And at the end of the day, there's people looking out for me, which is great in the government and spiritually as well. Good. You know, and, and that's where I'm going to thrive with this because guess what? If they can silence me, but they can't silence the fucking truth. And they've been trying to silence the truth for far too long. And it needs to, it needs to stop. And there's anybody whistleblowers too. This is the thing I'm going to urge. Anybody who has any information with this, whether they witness some more things with this, whether, you know, you're in the opposite spectrum. If you're anybody who's working in these programs, I know there's people who are listening to your show about this, by the way, who are probably on that side of the coin. Fucking man up and come the fuck out. Yeah. You got to stop the bullshit. And anybody who knows about this, well, guess what? If you know the truth and you're not revealing it, then you're complicit to it, too. So um, I'm urgent. Get a hold of me. I mean, I'm, I'll throw my email if you can put that link in. And most of all, get a hold of Dr. Greer. I'll put that link in there. Okay. But yeah, Dr. Greer, I mean, he's, a, he's been a good resource. And people need to understand, just like you and understand with this. He is basically a sounding board for all of us who have coming forward. And all he's doing is relaying information that he knows from people. He's got a strict vetting process with this. I know people are going to attest to that as whistleblowers. The fact is, he's not just going to take anybody's word because, yeah, somebody said something, right? I talked to him. I just interviewed him, right. as you know. Oh, yeah. And I asked him, how did he decipher who the bullshitters are from the real ones? And uh, we went into that because I, I think that's extremely important. Yes, it is. You know, and the, it's the not, he's, just, he, he's just not taking anybody's word for it. Yeah. I, I mean, he asked me repeatedly, you know, in law enforcement especially, you know, the tactics they use is they ask the similar questions, and especially the meeting I had with the Pentagon and, and all these other agencies. It's like they ask the same thing because they do, they do interrogations on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But the fact is my story is not going to fucking change. The way that I'm doing details is not going to change. My simple task with this is just to tell people what happened. Good. That's it. I'm not trying to gain profit. I don't want to be fucking famous. The only thing I, if I'm going to be famous for this, the only thing I want to be famous for is, oh, that's the guy that fucking stood up and wasn't afraid to do it. And he got the truth out there. Good for you. If I can fucking live with that, perfect by all means. Well, Michael, I know it takes a lot of courage to do what you're doing, man. And I just, I commend you for it. And it's an honor to have you in here. Well, Sean, thank you, man. And what you're doing on your n networks, your podcasts, your YouTube, I mean, you have a big big audience and I hope you know I, I got people trying to poke holes go for it I don't give a fuck what they think they weren't fucking there with me they weren't there with my marines they want to talk shit go for it I got one last question yeah if you could say anything to the other five marines that were on the ground with you that day because they might be watching what would you say to them don't fucking leave me hanging guys don't leave me hanging you know we're family we're fucking brothers we went through this shit you know, and I get that you're, you're, you got family. I get that you got kids. I got, you know, moving on. But fuck, man. I mean, you see what I'm trying to do with this. And I'm just trying to get the truth. You know, I, I, I hope that they do. And if I can't get them to come out and at least understand that, you know, yeah, there may be some aspects that are uncomfortable, you know, with what I'm having to deal with. But it's just the reality of things. It's not pretty. But if you got the fucking balls to do it, you know, I don't have kids. You know, me, I still got a lot to lose at the end of the day. And I know they do too. But the fact is, I'm just sick and tired of people bitching about things and not doing anything about it. Me too. And it's all a bunch of talk in this fucking world. It's all a bunch of talk. It's all I see on social media. That's why I'm glad I'm off of that. You know what I mean? That's why I'm glad I'm off because guess what? I don't get to see that anymore. I get to focus on what I'm trying to do. And, and for me, having people reach out to me that have open minds and are like, you know what? I actually heard about something like this happening in Vietnam. Or they like, I heard about this happening in 2004. And then there's people who are coming out that are participating in these operations unknowingly because they think the constitutionality of it's legal when it's not. And that's why this is happening because these people think that at the end of the day, they're doing something that's oversaw and they don't know that degree. It's very compartmentalized, as you know, being a CIA. You know, they only know what they're told and they yeah. only want to know what they're briefed on and what they're allowed to have access to, to depends on what they're doing. 
That's how they keep it secret. Yes, they do. And not everybody's going to know that. You know, so I, I hope that anybody who's in those industries understands that, you know, if, if there's anything that seems off, you know, don't approach it how the guy uh, that was at the Pentagon that talked about U.S. forces being uh, involved in Ukraine. I'm sure you heard about that because you saw FBI HRT raid his house and took him into custody. And he's probably going to sit in prison for the rest of his life because of revealing classified information on these platforms. Yeah, I'm not doing that. And these guys that are, do, are with me that are doing this, they're not doing it either. And the thing is, is because he did in that way means it's illegal because it's classified material to a degree. It may be illegal, but he screwed that up. Now, the way that we approached it was because we contacted the government and said, hey, this is what I know. This is what I was subject to. And they were, of course, because I approached it in the right way, they're going to reward you with the protection, with the law that they passed to make sure that you are well protected, regardless of what happens in a legal fashion. So these other whistleblowers need to understand that. So they can come forward. They're going to have the same protections. That's why I can paint them a picture and tell them what to expect. I can point them in the direction of who they need to talk to. You know, and, and just the, the humanity needs to understand that this false narrative that's going to be uh, portrayed in the media, such as alien invasions and stuff like that, it's been planned since the 50s. There's documentations talking about this as far as uh, SAIC or Science Applications International Corporation talks about the stagecraft. You know, honestly, if you're somebody who's such a high, envelop, uh, high developed species or something like that, it's like walking by ants. Yeah. Are you going to fuck with them? No, you're just like, there's fucking ants. They just won't buy. I think like the same thing that they do with us. Yeah. Why are they going to fucking try to fuck with us? But the same thing, we all of a sudden start shooting them down and then reverse engineering their stuff and then trying to weaponize it and then we're using it against each other for nefarious activities, trying to use the fucking, you know, these advanced projects to do very illegal, very dangerous stuff. It's just, it blows my mind how much this goes down. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just, my goal is just to hopefully get this fucking changed. Well, I hope it does. Me too, buddy. We'll be praying for you. Thank you. Cheers. Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.